moderating this panel will be Raymond Ibrahim. As, uh, as Mike said, the, the title of our uh, panel is Government Media and Societal Denial and Deception um, Concerning the Cops. <clears throat> and it's a, it's a good one because when you think of denial and deception, they have a symbiotic relationship. And so I think it's important to see how they work together, the interplay, and how it manifests itself in Egypt, and of course how it affects the Copts. Uh, <clears throat> when it comes to the, the first one, denial, when you think about it, it's really the easiest possible way to deal with a problem. <laughs> it, you just say it doesn't exist. You ignore it, and you put it out of, the, uh, put it out of sight. Uh, when you do that, obviously you don't have to even, it doesn't exist, you don't have to deal with it, and so forth. Uh, you see this very much <clears throat> uh, when it comes to which segments in Egypt are doing which of the denial and deception and so forth, uh, specifically in government and in media. Uh, in fact, that's our formal position, the government and the media, that there really is no real problem. And um, so first we would have to define the problem. If I were to define the problem, I would say that there's um, a discriminatory, uh, hostile um, <clears throat> attitude towards the cops of Egypt, which often culminates in violence and so forth. Um, and this is, of course, predicated on their Christian identity. So that would be the problem, if I were to define it. <clears throat> Most in government and media in Egypt, and of course elsewhere, and I'll, I'll get into that, uh, are deny what I would say. Their position, or the default position, <clears throat> would be basically that yes, there are attacks on them, but no, the Copts are an uh, integral part of Egyptian fabric society. No one, no one has anything against them just because of the religion, and the ones who do are just generic criminals, and they don't represent uh, Islam at all, such as Daesh, ISIS, the Islamic State. So that, of course, is denial, because as we know, the um, problems for the cops are above and beyond ISIS or formal terrorist organizations. Most of the suffering, persecution, oppression that they experience comes not at the hands of terrorists, but oftentimes uh, um, not just, basically it comes at the hands of the mob, regular criminal elements, and of course, Islamic clerics, oftentimes from, with high governmental associations or affiliations who incite the former to, to uh, do this sort of thing, the violence and the hostility and the discrimination. So that's, uh, that, that's the way the government basically would look at it, but also the Egyptian media does the same thing. The cops are just part of society, we all get along, we're one nation, one people, um, and then anything that happens to them that's considered an aberration out of the ordinary it has nothing to do with Islamic ideology or tenets and so forth. So, of course, <clears throat> when it comes to government media, both taking this position of denial, uh, that's uh, basically a, a white screen. It just blots out the issue and just suppresses it in Egypt, of course. Um, now, <clears throat> this sort of thing, and here's where you get the symbiotic, it also creates a, a culture of impunity for whether you're just a, uh, a radical Islamic terrorist who really does have an inbred hostility for quote unquote infidels, or whether you're a cleric for in the same reasons, or whether you're just a Muslim mob, or whether you're just a criminal who's not even religious. You, you could be a, an Egyptian Muslim, um, but you're not practicing. You're not practicing, uh, you don't even believe in it, but because of the culture that has been created, uh, culture of impunity, you take advantage of the cops. You target them for violence and theft and abduction, and, uh, ransoming and so forth. And by the way, a lot of these patterns that I'm discussing are very, very much similar in other uh, Muslim majority nations, uh, you know, Pakistan, for example, and all these other, uh, lots of countries, and of course the Arab world, Middle East. Um, so the, those who, who target for violence or abuse uh, are, are often the ones who exercise the deception. So for example, um, you know, after a Muslim riot, so let's say, um, and this happens very, very frequently, there's a rumor that cops are gonna build a church or renovate a church or are using a house as a church, and that leads to violence, <coughs> unrest, Muslims get up and engage in violence, and then this, the deception starts, including from the Muslim leaders of, let's say, the village that this happens. And they'll start blaming the cops uh, and any kind of pretext. And, and then the authorities, and here's, they become complicit. And because they operate on the assumption, which I'm not, they, they don't believe this assumption, the denial one, but they operate that, well, uh, in Egypt, cops and Muslims get along, they're one nation, there's no hostility because of religion. 
they will obviously side with the Muslims, and that's why you will see after these types of attacks, just as many cops arrested as, um, as uh, uh, Muslims for basically defending their church or whatever the case may be when Muslims are attacking. Or for instance, you can think of uh, the phenomena of luring girls, Coptic young girls, underage girls, <clears throat> luring them and then eventually uh, uh, you know, forcing or, con or compelling them to convert to Islam, marry a Muslim and so forth. Um, well, the deceit, you can see a lot of deceit from those who do it, of course. In fact, the, the, the concept of to lure someone is laid into the idea of deceiving them. Uh, and then once they do that, well, and they blame the cops, for instance, but then the authorities, who do they side with? Because obviously the, uh, the Muslim who abducted cannot be doing this because he's discriminating because one people. Then they side with uh, what he says and say, oh, okay, well, this is her choice and so forth. And one can go on and on, so, you know, the Mespiro massacre. Uh, here's cops demonstrating, standing up for their rights, and they get slaughtered, uh, I think 20 plus or close to 30 or maybe more. And what does the Egyptian state TV do? They portray the victims as the persecutors. And they were talking about how the cops are attacking the police and you know, it's a, they're not nationalists or traitors and so forth. So therein lies the, um, the sort of interplay between the denial and deception. It doesn't exist. There is no hostility. We don't believe that. And if it happens, it has nothing to do with it. And so <clears throat> we basically go in circles because if you can't um, address or even acknowledge a problem, you'll never, of course, deal with it. Such are my preliminary remarks. So now I'll start um, <clears throat> inviting our esteemed guests to give their, their remarks. Um, the first is Dr. Robert Herman, and uh, he's a senior advisor for policy at Freedom House. Uh, for the previous 11 years before that, he served as vice president for a number of international programs that in recent years included emergency assistance to frontline activists and organizations under threat. He has held positions with the Brookings Institution, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, U.S. Mission at NATO in Brussels, and served as a staff member in the U.S. Congress. He earned, <coughs> he earned his Ph.D. in government from Cornell University, having written his dissertation on the political and intellectual origins of the Gorbachev Revolution. Um, please, uh, please help me welcome Dr. Robert Herman. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I gotta lower the microphone. Um, although I'm still hoping for a growth spurt. So, um, so thank you very much. Um, uh, on behalf of Freedom House, I'm honored to be here uh, with all of you and uh, also with my esteemed panelists. Um, I was very inspired by the, first, by the first panel I heard this morning. People asked, is there hope? Well, you have no choice. You have to be hopeful. If you're going to bring about change in the world, you have to be animated by a notion that that you have efficacy, that you can bring about change, and especially for young people. I'm reminded, I see a lot of gray hairs out here like me, but this, uh, you know, we talk about building coalitions, but one of the coalitions you also have to build are intergenerational. And uh, those of us who've been around for a while hopefully have accumulated some wisdom, but I'm also, as someone who does a lot of work with young people, I always am reminded of this idea that young people are not just the future, they are the present. And uh, we're hearing that more and more. And if you look at demographic bulges around the world, it also happens to, to, um, to be true. Um, let me say, whenever I uh, travel around the world, which is quite often, um, I always try to see the religious community. Um, and not because I'm an expert on, on uh, freedom of religion, or not, but I also know that it's a critical barometer as to the overall health, I would say the sort of democratic health or lack thereof of a society. If you want to know what's going on, see about whether people are free to pursue their faith or in some cases no, um, no faith at all. I, um, on a, I made a personal trip uh, back in, uh, over the holidays and I was in the West Bank and in Israel and I was, I was there with Jews, Christians and Muslims who were working uh, to oppose the occupation. But one of the things that struck me, yes, there were some just horrible, terrible things that I saw, but what really left me with the sense of hope was these, these people coming together in common cause um, and the sense of efficacy that they had, that they could bring about, uh, that they could bring about change, and that to, you can, it's possible to build those coalitions. Um, for those who may not know about Freedom House, let me just say a, a very, very quick commercial because it'll help 
frame sort of what I'm about to say, and, and you'll, you'll see the connection here, which is um, for more than 75 years, Freedom House has been in the forefront of the struggle for, uh, to advance democracy and human rights around the world. And we do that through a combination of uh, publications, our research and analysis, a number of people were talking before how critically important it is, especially when you're dealing with, as you said, deception, when you're seeing what's happening in the press and all the rest, and everything that uh, one, does, one doesn't agree with is, is now labeled fake news. Um, Freedom House, through its publications, and its research has been putting out there most of, and some of you may be familiar with the analysis that we do every year called Freedom in the World on the state of, the state of uh, global health uh, of freedom. But we also do advocacy. There was a lot of talk about that earlier on. I was really, as a lifelong activist, I was really pleased to hear the, uh, this group grappling with how to, how to be more effective in carrying, carrying their message, raising the voices, putting these issues um, on the policy agenda. We likewise do that, meeting some of the same people you do. We're active in, uh, in Congress, but also engaging with the administration, doing that on a bipartisan basis. One of the nice things about Freedom House, we were founded as a bipartisan organization, and that remains very critical um, for us in carrying out our work. And mostly our advocacy really um, is Primarily, it's about how to elevate, uh, when we're here in the United States, how to elevate the priority that is attached to the U.S. being a global leader in, uh, in democracy and human rights. And that certainly has a strong dimension in terms of religious freedom. And then the last part of what we do is we actually have programming on the ground in lots of, lots of countries. Um, we were, in one way or another, we're equipping frontline activists with the tools the strategies that they need to be as effective as possible in carrying out their work, uh, bringing about change, systemic change in their societies on a, in a peaceful basis. And a large part of that, again going back to what we heard earlier, a large part of that is how to build coalitions, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna return to that. I'm also, I also wanna say that Freedom House proudly has a, has a history of speaking out on religious persecution um, and, and in a more positive way on, on the critical role of freedom of, of religion. And we do so across the spectrum, whether that's Coptic Christians in Egypt, Rohingya in Myanmar, Jews in Eastern Europe with the, with the now rise uh, of anti-Semitism are Baha'i in, in uh, Iran. As, I, as to uh, paraphrase the quote that was said earlier about Martin Luther King, an assault on faith anywhere is an assault on faith and freedom everywhere. Um, so let me, I thought one of the things that I could do um, in this, in my talk, is try to situate a little bit more the, what's happening in terms of the Coptic Christians in Egypt, and also, I would say, the larger tragedy of Egypt that's unfolded over the last several years, and put that in a, in a more, bring a global perspective to that. Which is to say that what we're seeing happening in Egypt with the cops, um, and the closing of civic space, which I'll, I'll talk, elaborate in a moment, this is not unique, this is not only happening in Egypt, this is a global phenomena. And in fact, we gather at a time where we are seeing uh, what some of us refer to as uh, modern authoritarianism, which is arguably unprecedented in its global scope and sophistication and its collaborative nature. Um, and its leading practitioners, including Russia and China, Iran, uh, and I would also put Egypt in that category, are not only crushing dissent at home, but they're also active beyond their boundaries in other countries and also trying to um, to under undermine the ability of, of multilateral institutions that have promotion of democracy uh, as, part of their, as part of their mandate. And at the same time that we're seeing this surge in authoritarianism, we're also seeing, very importantly, a backsliding uh, in democratic countries. Countries that we thought had made a lot of progress, uh, and yet, whether it's uh, Poland or Hungary or the Philippines, and some, and some have sort of also looked about what's happening here in the United States. And again, doing that not from just the perspective of what may or may not be happening here in the current administration, but looking at some of the systemic weaknesses that we have. And that shouldn't be a surprise. There's no such thing as a perfect democracy. All of them are grappling in many, many ways with uh, a number of challenges.
Uh, I mentioned about the shrinking of civic space. This is happening on a global basis. And what we're seeing is that the targeting of civil society and the media goes back to something that was said before. Um, why is that happening? In many of these countries around the world, the formal political, in, uh, the formal political opposition, political parties and the rest, they're not seen as a threat anymore. They've been co-opted. In some cases, they've been destroyed completely. The threat to authoritarian power more and more is seen as coming from civil society. Citizens coming together to organize, to advance uh, a, a common interest, and also journalists, especially investigative journalists, because it's no surprise that in many of these countries where you have uh, repression, you also have a lot of corruption. And the last thing in the world you want is organizations and, and, and journalists to go around talking about what's happening. Uh, I, I take the point you said this, uh, earlier that a lot of this is about uh, impunity. These things are happening with impunity. Attacks on civil society, attacks on Coptic Christians and Rohingya, and all these countries around the world. Um, this is happening. There's no, um, there's no uh, ability to hold people accountable. And why is that? Because fundamentally there is an absence of democratic institutions. And those, so I want to put what's all the discussion this morning, uh, part of the common root, including on this panel, is the absence of accountable governance, the absence of a commitment to the fundamental freedoms of expression, association, uh, as, well as, as well as religious belief. And that, uh, there's no, democracy is not a panacea, of course. But if you look around the world and you look where the, the levels of, of freedom of, of religion and faith are highest, are most robust, invariably that's happening in democratic societies. And that should not, that should not come as, as any surprise. Uh, what we're seeing in, in Egypt is really uh, an archetype of what, again, trends that we're seeing around the world, closing of civic space, the fact that activists and others who oppose, who oppose the government have come under threat. There's no ability to really weigh, uh, be part of the political system. And, and I know, because um, I had a number of friends, we talked about this, when the coup happened in, uh, in, in Egypt, there were those who thought that the situation uh, for Coptic Christians and also for, for civil liberties more broadly would, would improve. Obviously, that hasn't happened. One could argue that what's happened under al-Sisi, 40,000 people in prison, uh, independent media being shut down, um, Time and time again, we're seeing that all the, all the possible uh, institutions, all the possible uh, actors who could challenge the government to be more accountable to its citizens, all of that has, has, gone, has gone away. Now, as I said, democracy, not only is it not a panacea, it's not immune, we look around the world, democracy is not immune from the scourge of discrimination and persecution, including of minority communities. But it's far less present than in authoritarian societies. And let me, let me mention two elements of democratic political system as to why that's the case. The first one is that we, uh, people talk about democracy as, as the rule of the majority, and it is certainly that. But more importantly, the genius of democracy has to do with the protection and defense of the rights of minorities, especially historically marginalized communities. And that's what we're seeing around the world. That's what's happening, is those, those protections don't exist. And that applies to the Coptic Christians. It applies to some populations here in the United States. Uh, the earlier panel was mentioning about the history of, uh, of Native Americans here in the United States. Um, the second critical dimension of, of democracy democracy is the ability, very simply, the ability of people to organize about their grievances and to assert their rights. And it's the, it's the inability, I would say that it's the ability of people to do that, but simultaneously it's the inability of democracies to hide their weaknesses. That's what living in a democracy is about. We don't hide them, we bring them out into the open, we debate and discuss, hopefully in terms of mutual respect. Uh, and not, a, not the kind of polarization that we're seeing here and other places. We're able to come together to talk, about, to talk about policy, to have debates about ethics and the right way forward. And it's through that process that hopefully we move democracy forward. And if there's one lesson that I've learned in my work around democracy around the world is that 
it can never be taken for granted, even in countries where it's established. And all of us, young people, those who are seniors who've been around for a long time, we all have an obligation to help rejuvenate democracy on an ongoing basis. That's one of the important takeaways um, for what we, that are, cha are our challenge. Now, as I come back now to Egypt, one of the challenges that I see, and I was talked a little bit about in the, in the first, in the, the initial uh, panel, and that was the need to, to forge ties, to build a broad base of support, a broader base of support, to look beyond your own community. Yes, solidarity, Coptic solidarity within the community, of course. You need to fortify yourself. You need to speak, if you can, with, a, with one voice. That, that is absolutely critical. But at the same time, building building broader base of support to reach out to larger constituencies. And that includes, uh, we at Freedom House always talk about the importance of thinking about non-traditional allies. And for a lot of democracy and human rights activists who tend to skew, I would say, I, I would say secular, they don't think about the, the faith communities uh, in that way. And I would say the same thing is, is probably true of the faith communities. They don't necessarily see um, that those who are engaged in the struggle for democracy and human rights, because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, religious freedom and belief can best and most reliably be guaranteed in a democratic political system. That's a fact. That is a fact. And so if you want to advance democracy, I'm sorry, if you want to advance religious freedom, the ability of people to practice their faith, whether it's in Egypt or anywhere else, the best guarantee of that happening is to help build resilient democratic institutions. And not just institutions of rule of law, uh, of checks on executive authority, it's all those things. But you have to go, I would say, even deeper. Because the root causes of, of um, uh, persecuting uh, religious people of religious faith, the deep cause of that are things that are intolerance and othering. And as a consequence, those of us who want to build a democratic system, it's not just about the, the formal institutions, as important as they are. What you also need is the fundamental values that have to underpin that system and upon which those institutions will rest. And by here, I'm talking about an, ex an inclusive vision of that society. I'm talking about the ability to, to form coalitions. I'm talking about trust. I'm talking about uh, the, all, the, all the, again, the critical values of, that are necessary for people to come together and to advance their, their common interests. Now, Freedom House, uh, we have used our platform in this regard to champion uh, freedom of religion and belief. Uh, with, with NGOs around the world. And I, I would invite you, my, my colleague, Sammy Gerges is here. He's probably everything I know about religious freedom I've learned from, I've learned from Sammy. And I think it would be really helpful for those, if you wanna find Sammy a little bit later, to talk about specifically some of the work, some of the critical work that Freedom House is doing in the religious freedom space, especially in terms of helping act activists on the ground, including organizations that are involved in doing something very important, which is mentioned before, in actual documentation, um, documenting violations and all the rest. That's what's, that's what's critical. And not, just, and not just from the standpoint of documenting those things um, to portray, whether it's Coptic Christians or others, as victims. This is another really important part of, I think, our advocacy story. People also need to believe and want to see that there's resilience. And that is also a story for Coptic Christians and others struggling, um, especially as minority communities, struggling in many of these countries. It's the idea of resilience because that's also what gives people hope. So let me just, uh, I, I said at the outset that uh, ultimately we have to address root causes. So let me just leave you with a couple of um, things that goes to this question of how do we address the, the fundamental mindset, if you will, and the values that really lead societies in order to engage in, in othering that, that um, and that really impinge upon people's ability to carry out and to, to exercise their fundamental rights. Uh, we need to ask ourselves, 
what we are doing, as I, I mentioned this before, about articulating a, co a compelling, inclusive vision of society that celebrates diversity, religious and otherwise. And when I say we have this obligation, I mean all of us in all the societies where we live, and especially in terms of uh, thinking about those who are educators, and all of you are educators, um, because if you're educator, because you're meeting with other people, some of you, many of you have children, all of us, some of you are actually in the classrooms. So what do we, what do, we do to articulate an inclusive vision? What are we doing to teach young people about the sufferings of others that are very different from ourselves so that we can nurture empathy. I would argue that empathy is one of the most important things in building a robust and vibrant democratic uh, societies. And how do we also encourage people to know not just their rights uh, as citizens, we do a good job of that in the United States. We talk a lot about citizens' rights, especially young people know them, but they don't, necess they don't necessarily know about their obligations as a citizen in a democratic society. What are we doing so that, uh, to train them in that regard? And how do we encourage critical thinking? Again, this goes back to one of the major themes here. Critical thinking is absolutely essential because for one of the, one of the main reasons, it inoculates people against this exhortations that we'll see from fear-mongering demagogues, right? It makes the society more resilient, makes it so it can stand up um, to that, those uh, um, efforts to try, to, to try again to separate us and, and to divide us. And in short, what we're doing is, uh, is to model and convey the values that build and sustain a democratic political culture in which the seeds of hate cannot grow. And that is the best way to ensure that people can, can freely practice their faith. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, some quick observations to your fine speech. Um, you know, when I was talking about the deception and the denial in Egypt, we also have to remember that because of the deception and the denial that emanates from Egypt, there's also a lot of uh, de facto in, in uh, deception and denial everywhere else in the world, including in the West. And much of that, of course, uh, comes because if Egypt, the government, the media, uh, the people in, in power, the you know the authority figures, people El Azhar and these places where the Pope and so forth go and meet, um, insist there's no problem, denial, deception. That's what the rest of the world is going to walk away with. So I think that's just a, an important point to keep in mind. Um, one of the finer points that I, I thought you made was um, that we have to remember reform really, it's never going to come from the powers that be. Uh, it has come from the citizenry. Uh, the powers that be, the authorities, are always just interested in maintaining the status quo, which basically just means them on top. Um, and anything that shakes that, including uh, <clears throat> the present topic, obviously uh, will not be tolerated and be uh, suppressed, denied, and so forth. Uh, so I do think it's important, and, and it's a reminder that what we all do and other organizations do and individuals do is, in fact, important. We have to remember that one of the strongest um, allies or tools that we have that other generations and societies never had is the internet. And that really very much transcends uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, the, the innate censorship that would be found in governments and, and media and so forth who are trying to suppress the story. So when you have a citizenry who are the only one uh, capable of actually initiating reform, taking advantage of the internet, for instance, and flooding it with all sorts of information, the, the type that we're talking about, facts and figures, uh, and the reality, you get more and more people to learn, and of course that just strengthens the citizenry base into actually doing something that <clears throat> might eventually uh, culminate into the sorts of goals we're hoping for. Um, another thing that uh, uh, you mentioned that I thought, <clears throat> you know, a question actually maybe you'd want to address later, uh, and you sort of did, is basically, <clears throat> you know, you said a democracy is not a panacea for everything, and, which I agree with. And oftentimes, you know, it really morphs into an aqua, uh, an aqua, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of the Greek term, aqua but basically mob rule, <laughs> right? Uh, if it turns into, I mean, so basically, if you, uh, in, its, <clears throat> in its most um, simplest form, democracy, demos, you know, the people are ruling the majority. But if those people are guided by different principles, then that's not obviously going to be very helpful uh, to, let's say, minorities, religious minorities. Um, you know, so we're dealing with, and this now really goes at the heart of the denial and the deception. We're dealing, we have to admit, with a culture that <coughs> is in, <coughs> that is infused with a theological worldview that naturally sees non-Muslims as inferior and allows for this sort of thing. The, um, you know, what, the culture of impunity, whether you're the attacker, whether, whether you're the person who's turning the other, 
or I mean turning their eyes away and not looking at it, not, not accepting it. So I think that's one of the really deep issues that has to somehow be addressed um, and brought up and, and ultimately ameliorated because, hey, democracy, some of the worst forms of terrorism and attacking of minorities was really under a democratic, if you want to put it, uh, you know, meant, uh, construct. Uh, if you, Hitler and all of the, uh, you know, persecutions, well, he was very popular. So you can think of him as a people's, uh, you know, a populist type leader and what he did. So that's, I think, something also to keep in mind um, that it's, uh, it, you know, democracy inna innately, intrinsically is not necessarily going to fix something. It could even exacerbate it. But at, this, but, at, but at the same time, of course, if you have the foundation and the principles, uh, for instance, democracy in the West it developed in a good way because the principles and the foundations and so forth allowed for that. But if you're going to have antithetical things that are the groundwork, well, you're going to have a very morphed type um, of democracy. So maybe that's something we can discuss a little more later on. <clears throat> Our next guest is Mansour al Hajj, <clears throat> and he is director of the Reform Project at the Middle East Media and Research Institute. He was born and raised in Mecca, Saudi Arabia, immigrated to the United States in 2005, and he has a degree in Sharia and Islamic studies from the International University of Africa <clears throat> in Khartoum, Sudan. Because of his experiences as a teenager in Saudi Arabia, Mr. al Hajj has first-hand experience of radicalization tactics used to recruit and mobilize Muslims worldwide. His research and writings in Arabic <clears throat> and English have focused on understanding and eradicating the root causes of violent extremism in the Arab and Muslim world. He is a strong supporter <clears throat> of the concept of freedom of speech for the Muslim world and considers the revision uh, of Islamic heritage and history a vital element in the fight against extre extremism, which of course uh, ties up in what I was discussing in the interplay between democracy and foundational principles. And in 2010, he testified on Capitol Hill on the U.S. strategy for countering jihadist websites. Please help me welcome Mr. Mansour al Hajj. Uh, thank you for Coptic solidarity and uh, <clears throat> for, for this opportunity to, to give me this opportunity to come here and talk to you. And I feel very uh, honored to be at the same panel with. Uh, Raymond and Robert, and I feel the pressure as well, as you can tell. <clears throat> when I uh, read about the title of this panel, uh, the first thing that uh, came to my mind was my upbringing in Saudi Arabia as a foreigner, despite being born there and grew up there, and as a black person in Saudi Arabia. It was quite confusing when you're told that Muslims are equal and the only classification would be on the basis of piety, not the color of skin, not the tribal affiliation, and not the color of the passports. But in reality, none of that was true. And in fact, black people and those uh, those with no tribal affiliation and foreigners face acts of racism and discrimination every day, justified and normalized uh, by the government, uh, the society, and the media. It is quite frustrating when you are uh, deceived by your own government, which teaches you something in school and shows you the opposite in reality when the media ignores your plight and turns a blind, uh, a blind eye to the violations uh, committed against you, and when your own society is in denial of your plight. Uh, the systematic oppression, denial, and deception that the Copts have been experiencing for generations in Egypt is much worse than what I have experienced and what foreigners in Saudi Arabia are going through. I uh, will start by highlighting uh, some of the government aspect of uh, denial and deception, then societal and media, and I will end with a few recommendations. Uh, when examining the Egyptian government aspects of uh, denial and deception, we find uh, that the Constitution's second article, which states that Sharia is the primary source of legislation, remain problematic as it justifies 
uh, Muslim superiority over Copts. Uh, it is still a challenge for Copts to obtain government uh, authorization, authorization to build new churches and repair existing ones. Uh, the government reactions to terrorist attacks against Copt Coptic churches and violence against Copt does not match the intensity of the threat and the degree of danger uh, the Copts are enduring every day. Uh, Copts are still required to list their religion uh, on, on ID cards, which would expose them to discrimination and violence. In a number of cases of kidnapping of uh, Coptic girls, the police took no action, and even when girls identified that their kidnappers, uh, parents were told to drop charges, according to the Department of State uh, International Religious Freedom Report. Uh, Cops are also excluded from higher, higher positions in the government, the army, educational institutions, and the media in Egypt. So uh, <clears throat> societal denial and deception have been also expressed in multiple ways. Uh, for example, uh, the resident of uh, Al-Ur village uh, refused that uh, 21 uh, Christian Copts uh, who were who were killed, who were slaughtered actually by ISIS in 2015 to be honored and, and have a, a church honoring them in the city. So because of that, they had to build the church somewhere else. Another example is the widespread conviction among Muslims, which is in, accordan which is in accordance with Quran and dozens of uh, fatwas by Muslim scholars that a non-Muslim man cannot marry a Muslim woman. However, it's okay for a Muslim man to marry a non-Muslim woman. Uh, talented soccer, uh, Coptic soccer players have been discriminated against by coaches and teams. And according to a Coptic Solidarity Report, uh, there are no Coptic players on the international team currently playing uh, in the World Cup in Russia. One okay. Uh, moving, moving to the media uh, part of denial and deceptions, we find hundreds of materials uh, denouncing the struggle of Copts in Egypt and accusing them of exaggerating their plight and, and conspiring against Muslims. In an interview aired on a popular uh, TV show, uh, Al Qahir al Nas. Uh, last May, Egyptian MP and author Abdurrahim Ali refused to respond to a question whether he would elect a highly qualified Coptic as a president. Instead, he stressed that Muslims and Christians are equal in Egypt and referred to Najib uh, Sawiris as, uh, to prove his allegations. On YouTube, there are dozens of videos of Egyptian Salafi sheikhs uh, preaching hate and intolerance against Copts. These sheikhs include Ahmed al Naqib, uh, Sheikh Ishaq al Hawini, Yasser uh, Burhami, and uh, Muhammad Hussein Yaqub, and others, in addition to the Saudis uh, Wahhabis who continuously preach hate and intolerance on, on a daily basis. Uh, these videos and translation of them you can find at memorytv.org. Uh, we try to expose actually these uh, hateful preachers and shed some light on them which I think and it's uh, which which was which has been effective in actually um, uh, uh, making these hateful preacher sometimes um, apologize sometimes you know uh, watch what they say so Exposing them, I think, is one of the best tools that we at Memory are trying to do. Uh, furthermore, the Copts, especially those who live in the West, are often accused of treason uh, for highlighting the plight of Copts in Egypt and uh, collaborating with churches and human rights organizations, as well as uh, for urging foreign governments uh, to tie their foreign aid to Egypt to human rights. Uh, for re for uh, recommendations, I would like to recommend the following. Um, I really think we should urge uh, the Egyptian government um, 
to address all human rights violations and uh, against cops and minorities, meaning um, to include more cops in government positions and, um, and be more fair to the Coptics and, and uh, acknowledge their, their uh, uh, violations and their, that they're being oppressed. Uh, second, I would like to recommend that uh, exposing the businesses in Egypt and the ed individual who discriminate against uh, Copts. There are a lot of uh, uh, businesses in Egypt that don't hire Copts in, in, in their uh, business. Also, I would like to recommend exposing the preachers of hate, which we at Memory do uh, every day, even uh, in the Middle East or in the United States. We have a series of uh, preachers of hate on the website. You can go there and see, uh, it's not only in the Middle East, but even here in the United States, Muslim preachers still continue to preach against, uh, uh, and against Christians and Jews. And lastly, I would like to recommend empowering and supporting moderate voices, which I personally uh, do on, on a daily basis, because this is the hope we, even though it's very difficult to really find reasonable voices in, in the Middle East, I would like to say empowering them and, and supporting them is one of the best things that we can do. Uh, individual like uh, uh, Sharif Jabir and others, they really need our support, even though they're not cops, but they are supporting, you know, the, they are voices of uh, peace and love that need our support. So organizations like Coptic Solidarity and others, I know they always champion uh, in that uh, domain, and I, I really appreciate the, the work that they do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mansoor. Um, <clears throat> our third panelist, uh, he's here, finally. So, uh, <laughs> so um, I, I won't make any more remarks, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce him, and then um, if you're filling out Q&A cards, um, I, this is the time to start doing so. Andrew Miller is Deputy Director for Policy at the Project on Middle East Democracy, a nonpartisan nonprofit organization that examines how the United States can support the development of democracies in the Middle East. He also is a non-resident scholar at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and a former National Security Council uh, official under President Obama. Join me in welcoming him. Uh, thank you very much, and my apologies for being late. It's been a hectic morning uh, with quite a few meetings, so I'm sorry to have missed uh, Mr. Herman's uh, presentation and the, the opening remarks, um, but wanted to thank Coptic Solidarity for giving me the opportunity to uh, address all of you. Um, I started off my government career as an intelligence analyst, and uh, in the field of intelligence, denial and deception has a very specific meaning. And this is referring to uh, measures by which a country seeks to pre prevent its adversaries from learning about its activities. It's essentially a counterintelligence approach, and it's often associated with what are described as hard targets like Russia and Iran. They're primarily defensive measures to prevent outsiders from understanding what they're doing, particularly when what they're doing um, is either problematic or disadvantageous for those outsiders. My first thought um, in this context is that this is an excellent way to describe the Egyptian government's approach to uh, the Coptic community there. Uh, the government understands that um, the, uh, ro the position of Coptic Christians in Egypt is of concern to the international community, and just as Russia, for instance, might want to prevent the United States from learning about developments in its nuclear program, Egypt does not want foreign countries to learn about the true condition of cops in Egypt, particularly as it relates to the pervasive repression and discrimination against them. 
And uh, in this context, you see traditional denial and deception tactics. For instance, it's very difficult for embassies located in Cairo to get to Upper Egypt, where many Coptic Christians live, and where the conditions are, are often the worst for um, the Coptic community. Um, there's a clear effort to prevent um, uh, foreign officials from learning the true state of their condition. Additionally, it's hard for researchers to do work on the Coptic community in Egypt. Uh, they are, for instance, prevented from uh, asking about the uh, religious identity of the people they're interviewing, which makes it somewhat difficult to um, speak with a minority community defined by religion. But the more I thought about this concept of denial and deception, I realized that in addition to using these tactics in the traditional sense, Egypt was using denial and deception in a very different way. They were imparting new meaning to it. They were turning what was primarily a defensive approach to prevent others from learning to an offensive approach to advance their international interest. Uh, the, uh, there is a belief that by uh, presenting a certain narrative about what President Sisi and his regime are doing vis-a-vis -vis the cops, that they could win international support. So this is a very opportunistic approach. It's not uh, addressed towards threats, it's addressed towards opportunities the opportunity to cast um, the, the regime in Egypt in a favorable light internationally so that they can win support um, from the international community, including financial assistance, military assistance, diplomatic political support. And um, I think this illuminates a fundamental point about Egypt's approach to its Coptic community. And that is President Sisi and those around him view the Copts primarily through a foreign and not domestic policy lens. Sisi is a deeply insecure leader who is in pursuit of international legitimacy. And he understands that by portraying himself as the patron of the Coptic community, he can win assistance, he can win international support, he can win legitimacy. And this is a very important uh, point to understand. So again, it's not the traditional denial of trying to prevent um, outsiders from understanding what's happening, it's actually weaponizing denial and deception tactics to uh, advance his and his regime's interests on the international stage. So what does this denial and deception strategy look like in practice in Egypt? So in, in this case, deception, um, deception takes the form of misleading, in many cases, uh, a false narrative that Sisi is the savior of the Coptic community. And you see various tactics associated with it. One of them is his own rhetoric. He frequently refers to the concept of a united Egypt. He talks about equality for all citizens. He says, we are all Egyptians. At another level, there are symbolic actions. It's well known that Sisi has attended multiple church uh, cr uh, Christmas masses. Um, he's uh, he's uh, building a, a new Coptic church in the new administration, new administrative capital. And then the third tactic is related to church construction specifically. And you see this both with the regime's claims about rebuilding churches that have been destroyed over the past several years, but also with the way in which they've publicized the church establishment law um, that was passed last year. Uh, taken together, it creates an image of Sisi as a patron of the Coptic community, as someone who has rescued the Copts from the um, grasp of the Muslim Brotherhood and antagonistic Islamists, and has put them on a new era towards rights and uh, the achievement of their liberties. The reality is obviously very different from this. The first two um, tactics, the rhetoric and symbolic actions, are empty rhetoric. While it's good, certainly, that CC is going to Christmas masses or that he publicly refers um, to a united Egyptian community, it doesn't lead to tangible benefits for cops within Egypt. And the final tactic um, related to church construction is a deliberate misrepresentation. We all know the truth about the church establishment law. We know that um, it is, in fact, inconsistent with the Egyptian constitution, which supposedly establishes an equal basis for the construction of religious places for the three Abrahamic religions. And that is not the case. They created a separate law in order to regulate church construction instead of a unified places of worship law. And there are other restrictions on the ability of cops to build their, uh, to build their places of worship. And as a result, you have a huge disparity in the number of places of worship in Egypt. The most recent estimate I saw was there are 2,869 churches as compared to 108,395 mosques. The second um, component of this uh, dis 
denial and deception strategy is denial. And in this case, it's not denial in the sense of preventing others from learning about you. It's denial in the literal sense of rejecting any news or information that is not consistent with the government's narrative regarding the cops. And I think we saw this most clearly with the Egyptian government's reaction to House Resolution 673, um, which was tabled by Representative French Hill of Arkansas late last year. In the resolution, he, quote, expressed concern over attacks on Coptic Christians in Egypt, end quotes, and uh, made a number of recommendations regarding um, what Egypt should do to better protect the position of cops within Egypt. The regime's reaction to this was furious. They immediately sent a parliamentary de uh, delegation to the United States to educate uh, American parliamentarians, American congressmen and officials on the true condition of cops. They trotted out Coptic clergy members to deny that there was such discrimination within Egypt. The foreign ministry said the report was full of lies and they said it was unacceptable interference into the internal affairs of Egypt. So th that clearly demonstrates the degree to which uh, the Egyptian regime feels compelled to aggressively deny and reject, repudiate any ideas, any notions that aren't fully consistent with the narrative that they have propagated, which is that Sisi has rec rescued the Coptic community. So I, I think this framework of viewing denial and deception not just through a defensive approach, but through an offensive one, really does help us to understand the Egyptian government's strategy toward the Coptic community. But what does it suggest about how we can most effectively advance Coptic rights within Egypt? I think there are two points. One is, in the short term, the most effective way to do so is through international pressure. And that's because, as I mentioned before, CC views the cops through an international lens. It's an international issue, and um, the, the perception of how cops are treated abroad is often more important than how they're actually treated within Egypt. So mobilizing international governments, particularly those in the West who are viewed as most interested in the welfare of Christians and other minorities, like the United States, like the European countries, has the best hope in that short term of perhaps winning some concessions from the Egyptian government. But two, and I think this is a fundamental point, the international emphasis um, cannot be devoid of a domestic component. And the reason that Sisi has been able to treat the Coptic issue as an international phenomenon is that he feels that he can get away with it. He feels that the, uh, he feels that he can take Coptic support for granted. And all he has to do is enough to win over the international community, but he doesn't actually have to address the legitimate needs of the Coptic community as they live them on a daily basis. And unfortunately, whatever the intentions, a lot of the actions by Coptic leaders, including the Pope, reinforce this. When they go out and they defend President Sisi, even when he's taking actions that are antagonistic to the cops, when he denies that there is discrimination, when he denies that there are problems, that uh, relieves Sisi of the responsibility of addressing those issues. It makes it easier for him to forget about domestic concerns and simply focus on what's taking place internationally, on how people are viewing what's taking place. And in addition to the direct um, activism that one would like to see within Egypt by the Coptic community, it also serves an important international function because there's a limit to what the international community knows about the Coptic community within Egypt. Precisely because of the de denial and deception tactics I mentioned earlier, the Egyptian government wants to prevent foreign governments from learning what's taking place. And not only is the activism of cops important in its own right in terms of advocating for um, their own uh, liberties and rights, it's also important as a signal to the international community that something's wrong here, that, that their rights are not being upheld, that they are being discriminated against. And by taking a more antagonistic posture at times when there is a gap between the rhetoric and the reality, as I mentioned before, that serves an important function in both regards, in, in terms of telling Sisi and the regime that the Coptic community is not going to tolerate it, but also in telling the international community that there's a problem here and you need to focus on it. And, and so I think ultimately the longer term progress um, of the rights of the Coptic community in Egypt fundamentally depends on both of these forms of activism. The international variety that my organization is most involved with in working with Congress and the administration in highlighting uh, the discrimination that takes place in calling for measures that would in, that would encourage or induce the Egyptian government to live up to its rhetoric, 
but also in terms of the actions of Egyptians on the ground. Now, of course, it's an incredibly difficult operating environment, not just for cops, but for all individuals who are involved in activism, who are seeking to promote civil society. And uh, it's certainly not for the faint of heart, and it's easy for me to say what they should do when I'm sitting comfortably in Washington in a country that um, so far respects my rights anyway. Uh, and uh, I, I think that uh, it is, uh, th that relates to th this broader point that I'll close with. And it's something um, that has been mentioned uh, already on this panel, and that is you cannot separate out human rights concerns. You cannot treat them as, se as separate phenomena. You cannot pursue one against another, or you cannot pursue uh, another instead of another. It has to be a coordinated approach to improving human rights more broadly. Because as long as there are violations against human rights, as long as the individual liberties of individuals are not being respected, it creates a fertile ground for additional abuses by the government, for additional abuses by people who hold animus towards certain groups like the Coptic community. So there is, a, I think, a imperative for the Coptic community uh, and for other rights groups within Egypt to work together um, towards the same end and promoting a more rights-respecting environment in Egypt. Because the best way to advance Coptic rights and the best way to ensure that Egypt progresses in a more democratic direction is by building a united front in which you're working towards the same end, where not just one community or, or another is going to be respected, but an Egyptian, by the very definition of being Egyptian, is entitled to a certain uh, form of treatment or is entitled to certain rights. So I, I think that calls for broader uh, collaboration between the Coptic community and between a variety of other groups that are working on Egypt, including the, the Project of Middle East Democracy. And I know my organization has been very proud to work with Coptic Solidarity on any number of issues related to Egypt because we very much view ourselves on the same team. And we think that working together, uh, while the circumstances are, are, are certainly difficult, we're more likely to achieve important successes than if we're operating alone, even in the same direction. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll close. Thank you. Thank you.